uh, so for the last section of the time we have together this afternoon, um, be an opportunity for some discussion or uh, questions and answers. Please feel free if anyone would like to ask anything or tell me something. I love the line of some of the things we were saying today. Yeah. Remember last time when we were here, you he said that if someone was striving for enlightenment, uh, uh, then fear and wine should be avoided. If you are not, then it's like, uh, no. oh, let, let me just I didn't exactly say that um, I said I understand why uh, many people um, don't see the value or the benefit the need to abstain from alcohol um, and that the importance of it only becomes clear when you have like a spiritual goal and particularly Buddhist path of enlightenment where it becomes very clear immediately that um, it's an obstacle but if you um, if you're not pursuing a path to enlightenment then you, you probably don't even notice the effect that it has the detrimental effect it has on your consciousness Lines say that there's so many things that seem to be mentioned that are detrimental or obstacles you know, in terms of pleasure and self gratification. Um, but I noticed that if we avoid something, for example, uh, sex, so we might end up enjoying eating more chocolate or ice cream. Mm-hmm. That same, it seems to me that same energy goes in a different direction but the same similar self-gratification. Yeah. Um, well, well, first of all, the, the sort of the um, basic standard for, for a lay Buddhist is the five precepts. So that that's not um, um, a demand or a necessarily a need for celibacy. Um, but to refrain from adultery or not to become obsessed with sexual matters. But many lay Buddhists leading a normal family life with sexual relations with their spouses have realized the first level of enlightenment. So it's not um, necessarily an obstacle in itself. But the um, the principle by where whereby one thing is is abandoned and then um, the the energy is merely uh, transferred to something else. Yeah, I think that's a, you know a very common um, phenomena, and indeed even um, in the life of a monk, um, you know, abstain from so many so many things. But it's not to say that particularly in the beginning that that energy disappears altogether. But the idea with the uh, monastic life is you, you simplify your life so much um, that there are very few objects in which that kind of energy can be expressed legitimately. And so it's that much easier to, to see it as energy, to see it as, as attachment, um, rather than identifying with it or following it. So, um, I mean, in monastery, and, and so with, with any sort of group of People, the particular kinds of attachments can seem it's kind of comical or, or um, uh, fanatical to others. But I mean, I know monks who, who agonize over the color of their robes. You know, they see like these robes, we, we dye them um, naturally with jackfruit, half the jackfruit tree. And when you dye them first, you have this kind of more golden color. It gets darker over time. But, uh, you know, getting the exact right color... And, and monks may be not happy with it, and they re-dye their robes, and they add some more color, and they do this, and they do that. And 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 I've seen this all monks with their bowls, and they want a bigger bowl or a smaller bowl. And, and you know, there's one part of the monk who recognizes this is totally ridiculous, you know, and it's just pathetic, 
but at the same time, you know, as you see that, well, this is that energy, you know, that energy of just wanting the best or wanting what's beautiful. But, um, you know, because, as I say, there's just so few uh, material things that a monk's attachments can express themselves on, it allows you to, to see it very clearly um, and, to, and to learn from it and hopefully transcend it. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think in the beginning... In particularly a practice, there's, there's not really, um, you know, a shortcut around this. This will happen, but to to recognise that um, and to and to be learning from it all the time, to an extent to um, that that energy of grasping is not going to disappear because you you change its object necessarily. But having said that, um, it is um, helpful to restrict certain objects of indulgence. Um, if um, because um, they stir up uh, emotions and negative emotions um, in a particularly uh, unsettling way. So um, if you can, at the beginning, you can't uh, let go of this altogether, um, you try to channel it into um, the least harmful um, objects as possible until you can go to the next step. Mm-hmm. So having greed, greed directed towards Dharma mm-hmm. and wanting to be with monks and good beings, mm-hmm. that good greed? Yeah, I mean, there, there are, there are diff- in Pali, there's a lot more kind of sophisticated language um, for dealing with mental states, and so we have the different kind of words for this. We have like, Tama chanda, tama gamo, tama gama, which is, is all, uh, so gama, the word is usually used uh, for sensuality, sometimes used with regard to tama. But the, the distinction between, if you like, good greed or bad greed or uh, wholesome, unwholesome desire is that unwholesome desire is, is always based at um, a particular experience in the future that you want. Um, whereas the, the wholesome, and the good kind of desires are to do is it's for action. So, a you know, classic example: if you, you know, if you want to do good, uh, do good things, um, that would be a very wholesome desire and one to be um, supported. But if you want to be a good person, then you, you know, you're going to have problems. Um, you just sort of create this sense of self and attachment and um, kinds of. Um, um, vulnerabilities or blind spots when you do that. So it's always more on you know the the action itself. So if you want to sort of um, spend time with wise people or people that um, you feel um, help you to be more mindful and to be kinder and and um, to act in um, better ways, then that's intelligent. Um, if you compare it with you can see that um, you're affected in, in good ways by certain people and unhelpful ways in others. And it makes sense to hang out with people that bring out the best in you rather than the worst in you. Mm. Why is it that with uh, Asian audiences, it seems that the discussion of mystical experience and synchronicities seems to inspire or instill a faith? Westerners um, reaction. And just as a follow up to that, what do uh, monks do uh, to avoid attaching to those kind of experiences? Yeah, I, um, I'm not sure I agree with your initial premise um, in that I think it's something to do with audiences and in in Thai Buddhist context then you know it's the audience is the whole the whole of the country whereas in in American or Western Buddhist circles then you tend they tend to have uh, you know a very middle class educated tend to be intellectual kind of audience so it's a sort of a slice of the society and those kinds of that kind of um, person is very excited by all those kinds of things and it has a lot to um, already in their own tradi- religious traditions to to answer that kind of need and I think that many of the people who come to Buddhist 
um, centers tend to be, you know, a little bit wary of that whole area of spiritual life. So I'm not sure it's where it's an Asian Western dichotomy as much as different kinds of different groups of people. Um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, in terms of monks, well, first of all, the um, the Buddha um, prohibited monks from revealing any kind of um, psychic powers or spiritual attainments from anyone who's not a monk. Um, so reasons for that, both for the monk's spiritual welfare and for the welfare of the sangha as a whole and for the, the best kind of relationship between uh, the sangha and lay people. So if, um, if, if monks started to uh, reveal um, psychic powers or um, accomplishments, then they're going to become very popular and people are going to flock to see these monks um, and probably cause some disharmony in the monastery and may be a, um, a cause for certain monks who haven't um, actually realized these kind of things, claiming falsely to have in order to get that kind of attention, um, can cause a great deal of corruption in the monastic order. Um, and because there are people who are always going to be very excited by these kinds of things, then often people will disregard the, the more profound teachings and just be uh, just spend their time um, <clears throat> uh, devoted to this kind of this kind of thing. Um, the Buddha um, is a very famous um, case in which um, a layman in the Buddhist time. I can't was it he put some he put something on top of a pole, didn't he? What was it? Some some kind of object on top of a pole and then he had invited all the members of all the different sects, you know, who who can actually use their psychic powers to remove this thing from the top of the pole. And um and the the monk who could do it was a Buddhist monk. And so many people became um uh, uh interested in Buddhism and became inspired because the Buddhist monks could do things that the others couldn't do. So I think this monk was kind of proud of himself that you know he made a name for Buddhism in this particular area. Um, but the the Buddha was um, very critical of him, um, and he said it's like it's like a woman showing her underwear to, to to people. You know, it's like something that should be concealed, and it's very vulgar and and um, uh, uh, and um, improper for a Buddhist monastic to to lead people on. Like that's not the kind of convert that we want, in other words. Um, and so, in in meditation traditions, then we're constantly being told that. You know, because these things, people do develop these things in, in um, meditation monasteries. Um, and, you know, so that you have a, um, you know, I know a number of monks who've developed these things and, and um, completely lost in them, ended up going crazy on one or two occasions. Um, um, and other monks who developed these things and then they... Um, uh, they declined, and then they didn't possess them anymore for one reason or another, and just couldn't deal with that sense of loss. And so, teachers are pointing out, you know, that um, when you start to feel that you're kind of special because you've got these special powers that nobody else does, so that's that's incredible danger to spiritual progress. And so, these things are probably um, more, you know, uh, they're more more of a drawback than an advantage. Um, there are certain psychic powers that monks can can use to advantage. Probably the one um, most commonly used is ability to read other people's minds. But that again is a double-edged sword. I mean, if you have, um, if you read the biography of Ajahn Man, who is probably of the monks in the modern tradition, most gifted with all these powers, and he himself um, recognised that there were number of monks who just wouldn't go near him or didn't want didn't dare train with him because he could read their minds and he was just too ashamed and embarrassed about it so for every monk who's really inspired and is extra special extra specially vigilant in the you know, when he's living near his teacher 
um, and develop, you know, gain some benefit from it. There are all the others who are completely paranoid and anxious and, and, uh, you know, don't even dare go to see the teacher. So, you, you know, even in these, these authentic, um, and even in the, um, possession of a great master who's not going to be misled by them or misuse them, often masters just decide just to put them to one side and, and, um, not, it's just not worth it. You know. You know, I think um, if if um, I, I I have um, like a, a comparison or analogy when when I when I go to Ubon, sometimes you know, when the plane's up high and you see the Moon River, the Big Moon River, you know it it seems reasonably straight, but as the the plane reduces in height, you can see that it's meandering, you know, uh, quite extensively. It's winding. So that when you're very close, something seems to be very windy and, and convoluted. And then when you're higher up, it seems much straighter. And I, 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 I was looking at this one time, I was in the play, and I, I was, because I'd just been spending time with parents, children. And I think maybe if you're so close to your child, you know, and every single thing, you know, becomes, because it's your, your only child or your only two children, you know, everything is, it comes magnified, it becomes such a really big, important thing and you're worried that this is a um a, a habit which is going to get worse and it's going to um but i i think that you know once you have the the basics in place um and you have a good foundation you have to allow for for some ups and downs and and um you you do your your duty and you have two duties one the duty to be you know good mother but also you have a duty to yourself and not to suffer in being a good mother. Um, and, and with children, I think it's important that, you know, you teach them, you, it's your duty to teach them what you feel is right, the kind of values that, that you, you as a family want to uphold. Um, but, uh, sometimes, you know, not, not everyone's on message and, and you, you, you have, right to express your feelings you know to say look this is this is what we like that this is what we've decided on in our family this is our agreement as a family um you know and i do you agree with this you know and once you have a basic agreement that living together with mutual respect is living to, is better than living together disrespectfully um then it's a question of each person living up to their promise or living up to their their agreement. So it's not a matter of between you and your daughter or you and someone else. It's between your daughter and her agreement. So, you know, is, is she, is, does she, she recognize that, that uh, when we live together with mutual respect, it makes us feel good and it makes us, gives us strength as a, a family and, as, and gives us harmony and, um, but then just as, you know, like when you meditate, you know, you make a determination to, 
be with your breath, but then, you know, next minute your breath is somewhere else, and we know how that is. And it's the same, you know, with uh, agreements in families and standards. You forget, you know, and it's not like you're really malicious or um, I, I don't, you know, I know your daughter. I don't think she's sort of malicious like way. I mean, she just forgets, you know, just like you forget your breath when you're meditating. But um, I think, you know, when when you're all feeling in a good mood and together, you know, if you talk about this in terms of, you know, our, our family and our values as a family, and do we all agree with this? And this is what we, this is what we agree upon. And then it's each person try to live up to their agreement. So maybe it's your job as a mother to say, look, you know, this was your determination. This was your goal. This was your, uh, your, your ideal. And I think, you know, you're not living up to that as well as you could. Do you think that's true? Do you agree with me? So rather than being between mother and child and so have these kind of battles between mother and daughter, mother and son, father and daughter and all these kinds of things, it's like you're a, you're a unit which has shared values which you try to live up to. I think this is a better way of, of doing it. Yeah, well, as, as you know, I, I give very few um, talks in, in English. I mean, there's a huge amount of stuff in Thai, of course. Um, uh, in English, there's basically what talks I give here, a talk in, uh, with, with Tan Bandit in, in November, and then if I go to visit monasteries overseas, they record the talks and put them on the web. Um, I think that uh, Birkin has, has most of those talks on, it, on its site. Really, send them an email and complain. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, um, they they probably don't know. It's probably some some problem in their the computer system. Um, no, there, you know, there's one or two books, and then there are, there are some CDs which um, I, I don't know if you you've ever received any of those. And, and I don't. You take, what what's the? Yeah. We have some CD downstairs, yeah. So, uh, I'm not teaching retreats in in English these days. I do two or three in Thai every year, and that's kind of as much as I want to take on at the moment. Right? From Torsi School. Do, do you speak Thai? Uh, From Vietnam. Maybe not, but yeah. being there would be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I said don't. Oh, don't. Oh, okay. Yes. Very important word that. It's it's very rare um, that I'm giving teachings. I mean, if I go down, usually it's um, just to go to the school. Um, but I, I will be. The, there was an announcement made this morning. This um, conference, um, conference um, on the twenty fourth in uh, the CBC, where I'll be giving a talk on this um, a day of, of discussion on Buddhist um, education princi- principles of Buddhist education. Um, and other than that, entire yes. Yes. There's a big poster up somewhere. And then um, 10th, 
10th of November I'll be giving a talk for uh, the Little Bang group. So that's the main program at the moment. Again, I maybe mean, I wasn't so clear. What what I meant by that is just not not sort of counting consecutive breaths, but just taking one breath as a unit and then starting again. So it's like it's not like one, two, three. It's like one and then one and then one. But there is a um, uh, a method of counting breaths also, particularly if you're just beginning to meditate and um, not very proficient. And that is like on you count breath in breath and out breath one. And then in breath two, out breath two, in breath three, out breath three, in four, out four, in five, out five. And then when you get to five, you start again and you count one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, five, five, six, six. And then you start again and you count one to seven and you start again one to eight and then one to nine and then one to ten. And that's like one cycle. So you, you can make that kind of a goal for yourself to see whether you can count from 1 to 5, 1 to 6, 1 to 7, 1 to 8, 1 to 9, 1 to 10 without getting distracted. So it, it's quite it's good, I think, in the beginning to have that kind of goal because at the start you can't do it and then you find you can, after a while, yes, you can do it. So you, a little bit of self-confidence that, yeah, it's not so difficult. Um, and, and counting that staggered way of like 5, 6, 7 also means that you can't just sort of switch into automatic like you can if you use a, like a, a, a meditation word like butto, you know, and you can have like butto, butto, and then underneath there's all these other sorts sort of floating along. But, but when, you, when you have to be changing the number that you're counting towards, you have to be right there and you recognize very quickly if you've lost it. So it, it's a very um, good, um, like a warm-up meditation, like a good way of just developing some facility of being with the breath, and it gives you like a measurable um, standard of progress. Because often when you meditate, that's one of the things you feel you're not getting anywhere. Sometimes you feel it's getting, and then you're sort of back where you were again. So having that kind of, um, that, that counting technique lets you see, well, yes, actually, I can, I can do this, like one whole cycle or two cycles. And if, if you use that counting technique after a while, it gets a bit kind of heavy, and and then you just want to put it down and just be with the breath without without the counting. But if your mind's very scattered, or you just wanting you're just really trying to establish some kind of practice, it's it's a good way of doing it. Um, I I think a point that that needs to be made over and over again also is that it's it's not just the kind of an application of a, a technique which you completely abstract from the rest of your life. You know, it's not like a, you know, like a Hatha yoga uh, routine or something where um, your your success and your experiences in meditation uh, are going to be intimately connected with how you live the rest of your life. Um, and, um, and and that's why you begin to see, you know, why, why, there, why you have to keep precepts and why you do this and why you do that because... Um, you, you begin to become more sensitive to things that help you to be mindful and things that make it more difficult to be mindful. So, it's, uh, sorry. Yeah. Um, okay, counting your breaths. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, I find some kind of time. Yes. 
Yes, exactly. I, I mean, th- I mean, this is the, the the problem. I mean, we you know we we tend to be familiar with two extremes: the extreme of thought, agitated thought, and and dullness or sleep. Um, and so, mo- most of us, when we begin to meditate, then we're dealing with the agitation. But as the agitation uh, is reduced, then all these signals are saying, time to go to sleep, um, because that's what usually. Um, the only time when we experience that reduction of, of, of thought activity uh, is in a time of relaxation or sleep. Um, so, so the whole um, skill and art of meditation is is finding that middle way where you're not agitated and you're not um, asleep. And yeah, it's 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 tough because it's going against the the grain, going counter to the stream of you know the way we we lived our lives um, but I think that also it's not just to that coarse level of when there's not a lot of stimulation going on then we feel this um, this tendency or this draw towards drowsiness or sleepiness um, there there is also um, tendency that we have uh, many of us when when things get a little bit difficult in life just to want to stonewall, just to turn our back, walk out the door, um, shut things down. Um, and that, that's you know, all these kinds of tendencies that we have in our life become manifest in meditation and vice versa. Um, and so um, apart from that kind of natural um, lack of, lack of um, familiarity with this state of mind which is neither agitated or sleepy, then there are these other kind of more uh, subtle and um, um, personality traits um, which can uh, which can come into to practice. I mean, men have this more than women, generally speaking. The sense just to want to shut down when and to I don't want to talk about it. You know, so women want to talk about it, men don't want to talk about it. That kind of um, cliche situation, but um, it can be that kind of. Um, inability to be with things that are um, kind of messy and difficult emotionally. So it's also you know, part of that kind of exploration um, of, of meditation when we're beginning to see these kinds of um, personality traits we have. Like when we try to meditate and, and, and we can't and the mind's wandering off. And, and so that's, we're, we're having a very uh, immediate, clear um, expedition of how we deal with disappointment, how we deal when we can't control things, how we can't make things go the way we want them to go. Do we get angry? Do we get frustrated? Do we get bored? Do we just give up? Do we stick with it? Um, So we're we're seeing this is the raw material we have to work with. It's not saying anybody's good or bad or better or worse, but we all have different um, habits, you know, dealing with um, inability to pursue a path that we want to follow and how you know how we um, how we can work with that and manage it so um, initially as I was saying just now that this counting um, counting breaths um, if we are staggering the number that you're counting to counting to five to six to seven to eight to nine to ten constantly shifting the number that you're counting to rather than just sort of counting sheep from one until you fall asleep then then I think that that that's uh, help. Also, it's it's constantly bringing up this this ideal and this reminding yourself. This is what meditation is about. It's about being awake. It's about being aware. It's not just about sort of drifting into this kind of peaceful state where um, you feel kind of good and, and fuzzy and peaceful. That you know that's um, uh, not the kind of Buddhist samadhi that um, we're trying to develop.
Yeah, I, I think it varies from, from person to person. And when you first start, it's a good idea to try different things uh, for a while and, and see if something you, you, you find really suits you. And then after a, a period of trying a few things, then just choose one and stay with it. Um, whatever whatever technique you use, you're going to have difficulties. It's not you can't just bypass uh, the the hindrances and difficulties in meditation. But the um, the walking meditation is very important because you're developing mindfulness in a very much more natural kind of um, posture. And it's mindfulness in movement. So your eyes are open and you're moving. So it's not so different from how you feel when you're just walking around normally. And so the, the, the inner, the awareness and alertness you develop in walking meditation is more easily integrated into daily life than that comes from the sitting. But you need the both. You need the, the, the mindfulness from the stillness of the sitting posture and the mindfulness in movement. And if you can alternate them, then that's that's the best to do some of both, not just just one. But um, the sitting, the walking is very good if you're if it's late at night and if you sit, maybe you fall asleep. So better to walk. Um, it's just um, different. It's more kind of relaxed kind of awareness, and you can do it in the nature and and um, walking in a park. You can turn into walking meditation. And um, if you uh, if you have um, bad legs and knee pain, or you uh, have some illness and sitting is not possible, then when you have the walking as an alternative, it means you always have some way of practicing. But uh, as far as the kind of Lumpotian method, I think some people like that, some people don't, and something you can try out and see. Mm. The first time I ever saw this Lumpotian method, I, I was uh, teaching in, in Jula University in Bangkok, and so uh, it was outside in the Tamasatan Jula, and there were all these people coming and going and sitting for a while and then going. And, and so I've been, I've been meditating, and I look up, and there's this young woman sitting right in front of me, and she goes like this. And I, was, I was really shocked, and I thought, <laughs> That's not very proper for a young woman to do that to a monk. And then she, then she did so. Oh, I realized she was doing some <laughs> meditation. <laughs> yeah, I was shocked and I opened my eyes. You don't recognize that this is frustration. This is what frustration's like. It's like this. This is what boredom is. You know, it's like you don't have to get rid of it. You know, it's just recognize it, you know. Um, the, rather than uh, boredom is a problem, and I've got to deal with boredom. You know, oh, this is what happens when, you know, there's not so much, so much interesting going on. This is, this is what happens. And you just look at it. And when you make peace with boredom, then, then boredom doesn't last very long. You know, it's actually trying to get rid of it that makes it worse. So, so it's like, okay, this is boredom, and then you go back and try to force yourself to count the breath after, like, looking at the breath. No, boredom doesn't stop you looking at the breath, is no, it? Just, no, it's like you do two things. Well, like, you well no, I, I mean, like, let's say you're, you're, you're staying with, you're with your breath, and then maybe you feel, oh, this is so boring, you know. Um, and then you reckon, well, that's just a thought, isn't it? Just a thought that's appeared in your mind. You don't have to identify with it. You don't, you don't have to fight with it. You don't have to believe it. You just recognize it. Oh, this is this is one of the kind of reactions in the mind to meditation. Um, so then you look at, and maybe it comes another again. But this is really boring. So, you know, and it's a, yeah, okay, it is, yeah. But I'm still going to keep doing it. Um, I'm not going to stop just because it's boring. Um, if you realize, it's when you realize with defilements like these things like this, just, just how they um, restrict you, you know, how, how, how kind of constricted and, and impoverished your life becomes if you're gonna, only going to do things that don't make you bored, you know. And then you realize, you know, if you can just go over that, 
and just go through it and come out the other side. You know, you've, say you with your breath and you have a period where you feel it's really boring, but never mind, I'll just keep patiently doing it. And you come out the other side and you don't find it boring anymore. Then you, you really learn something. You know, you really say, yeah, boredom is just, it's just like the weather. You know, it's just like you're, you're driving a car and you go through some fog and you come out the other side. You know, it doesn't mean, oh, I'm bored now. I've got to stop. You know, yeah, because then you're being conditioned by boredom. But now you're being able to see boredom as a condition which you don't have to follow. You don't have to believe in. You know? Um, well, what can I say? Um, well, just keep practicing and then you'll know. <laughs> no. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, just go back to your first question. I mean, um, when Ajahn Chah, my teacher, was practicing by himself, um, and he was alone a lot of time. Then he had a lot of problems in his meditation for some time. And then he went to visit a teacher on top of a mountain and spent a couple of nights with him. And uh, then I remember that afterwards, you know, he said, you know, in the end, I would have worked this out, but it's so much quicker, you know, when, when you meet a teacher. So, you know, given the fact that we don't have unlimited time, yeah, there are a number of, of um, questions that it's actually better to work out for yourself. You know. But there are also um, questions which having answers from someone who's well practiced and um, can save you some time, you know, in your. the. Um, but in the end, you know, the doubts only end with your own experience. As you can go to a teacher and you ask them a question and they. And then they, you know, they give you an answer and you're very satisfied with the answer. And then you read a book and somebody else has a different answer. And then you're so full of doubt again. And then you go and see another teacher and he maybe gives a third answer. It's like going to see a doctor with all the different opinions, you know. So, um, you know, ultimately, you know, you go, you go beyond doubt when you see for yourself. Yeah. Sorry, what was your second question? I mean, Well, it develop facility in both, and you know, say certain times and places, um, it's it's easier, better, more appropriate for walking than sitting. Uh, if you have some uh, difficulty preventing you sitting for very long, or it's the time you just had a big meal, sitting's not a good idea. Walking's better, so on. But most people find that they they enjoy one or the other more. So in that case, it's perfectly all right to do one more than the other, but you shouldn't only do the one you like and re- neglect the other one because they, they, they balance each other. So I mean, if you're, if you're practicing, you know, you can sit for two hours and walk for two hours and sit for two hours and then just one day it's just gone like that. Yes. One of the things that I find really hard to do is to try and control my breathing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't think it just stops the initiative and the initiative. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, you know, it, it may be that the, the breath is not a good object for you, and for some people that it, that is the case. So, you know, if if after a long time you're just really not working for you, you may need to find another uh, object. Um, but having said that, you know, experiment a bit with with posture and different ways of sitting. Um, but uh, um, one one technique also 
um, is to using your imagination and imagining that you're breathing from the soles of your feet upwards at the breast coming up your legs up into your body and then going down out through your feet so um, that that's that's one method of changing your perception of the breath because you, you're not actually breathing through your feet but it's just it provides a kind of relaxation and just feeling the breath sort of com- coming up and so um, and you another uh, another um, technique is just to say imagining your body like a like a balloon that's just expanding and um, contracting as the breath comes comes in and out so try uh, experiment with with different kind of postures um, and then using your perception or imagination to think you know, the actual the breath can, say particularly coming in through the feet is a good one for just changing your whole relationship to the breath yeah yeah try try different things and see see what works and mm-hmm. yeah. Okay, that's uh, thank you. That's the end of the session.